remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Because evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And if you've watched this show uh, very often, if you've seen very many of these shows, you, you're probably aware, you've probably caught on that we talk a lot about history on this show. We probably talk more about history on this show than uh, really any other political commentary show will do. We're kind of unique in that regard. And I suppose we come by some of that honestly because of my background. I, I have always had a love for history and, and have a degree in education with an, an emphasis in history and social studies. That means that I am fully qualified to teach history to your children. And for those of you who hate me, let that sink in for a second. I can teach your kids. But laying that to the side, because of that background, I suppose, because of that love for history I've had, I suppose that uh, I often look to history as a source or as a mechanism to determine how we should approach the problems and the issues of today. I think that's a very smart thing to do. So, yes, we do talk a lot about history on this show. And we're going to talk a little bit about history today. Today I want to talk about America's foreign policy crisis. But before we do, I want to give you a little historical story. I want to take you back into history. I want to take you back to the era of post-World War I France. I want to talk about World War I and France after World War I for just a moment, if you will indulge me. Now, by the end of World War I, France had lost more than one quarter of the Frenchmen between the ages of 18 and 27. A quarter of the people, of the men in that age range, were killed during World War I. That is a tremendous cost, no doubt about it. Uh, that, that, that is far more in terms of proportion than, than any country, to my knowledge, has ever lost in a war. And so clearly that had an effect on the French people after the war. The, the French people after that war were very war weary. They, they wanted to avoid war at all costs. And understandably so, given the cost in life that their nation had experienced during World War I. After the war, intellectuals in France, teachers in France, officials in France, journalists in France, really began pushing a lot of pacifism and, and downplaying patriotism and, and really trying to set a narrative, a cultural narrative, where the avoidance of war was more important than patriotism. You would often see newspapers in France uh, use a, a similar phrase to anything but war when it came to dealing with foreign affairs after World War I. Again, somewhat understandable when you consider the tremendous loss of life of that 18 to 27 age range in France during World War I. And that even had impacts on, on things like the, the, the average height of Frenchmen, you know, during, for, for some decades after that, and any number of areas. That had tremendous ripple effects through France. There was a lot of pressure from the intellectuals and the, uh, the teachers and the journalists and so forth not to rearm France after the war. And to renounce the very concept of war, to avoid it altogether. But what was the result of that? If people in France just were bent on living in a post-war society, they had experienced the horrors of war like few others ever had, and understandably to an extent, they wanted to avoid it ever again. But what was the result of their embracement of pacifism with their hesitancy to rearm themselves? Well. When Germany began violating the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, they violated that by rebuilding their armed forces, which they were prohibited to do by that treaty, reoccupying the Rhineland, which again, they were prohibited to do by that treaty. When they did those things, France and Britain were aware of what Germany was doing, but they were hesitant to step in and use force to stop them. After all, they had been through the horrors of war. They, they wanted to do anything but go back to it. Anything but war, as the papers would always say. So now Hitler and Germany are rearming themselves, they're building themselves up, they're going into the Rhineland, they're doing all of these things that they are prohibited to do by the treaty that ended the war, and yet France is hesitant to put their foot down. Well, the result 
was that Hitler's aggressions went unchecked. The result was World War II. The result was instead of avoiding war, war ended up back on their doorstep. Now, how did all of that come out? Well, let's let's consult one of the one of the better books on the topic I've ever read, Intellectuals in Society by Thomas Sowell. There's a whole chapter on intellectuals and war in this book, and I'm going to quote from Sowell regarding what happened in France after Hitler had regained his strength. Quoting from Sowell, France's behavior in the Second World War was an extraordinary contrast with its behavior in the First World War. France fought off the German invaders for four long years during the First World War, despite suffering horrendous casualties, like we talked about earlier. More wartime deaths than a larger country like the United States had ever suffered in any war or all of its wars put together. Yet, during the Second World War, France surrendered after just six weeks of fighting in 1940. In the bitter moment of defeat, the head of the teachers' union was told, quote, you are partially responsible for this defeat, end quote. Charles de Gaulle, Francois Mauriac, and many other Frenchmen blamed a lack of national will or general moral decay for the sudden and humiliating collapse of France in 1940. A nation that had fought so hard in the First World War, and yes, undergone a tremendous amount of loss in doing so, but emerging victorious, were ill-equipped, not in terms of manpower, not in terms of weaponry per se, but ill-equipped in terms of national will, ill-equipped in terms of the readiness to fight those who would do them harm in World War II, and they capitulated after only six weeks. Now, why have I taken that little uh, detour this week to tell you that story? I tell it to you for this reason. As we stand here in 2014, America is a very war-weary nation. There's no doubt about it. That's not restricted to political party. It's not restricted to political viewpoint. Many Americans of all different, all, all different political ideologies, ethnicities, backgrounds, whatever you want to name, plenty of Americans are sick and tired of war. We want nothing more than to live in peace, most of us. But what we often lose sight of is the fact that as sick and tired as all of us are of war, and we have been at war in this nation now for, for 12 years, since September 11, 2001. After that constant 12 years of war, so many of us are sick and tired of it, but we forget, we often forget that Muslim terrorism is still an issue in this world, as evidenced by Benghazi, the Boston bombing, Fort Hood. And despite the necessary deaths and the positive deaths of Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein, and I'm not taking anything away from those very positive things that happened, but in spite of those things, Muslim terrorism is still an issue. Even if we get out of Afghanistan, even as we draw down forces in the Middle East, or whatever we want to do, Muslim terrorism still exists. It is still a problem for us. Likewise, Vladimir Putin and Russia are clearly trying to add to their power by their actions in the Ukraine. Kim Jong-il continues to rattle his sabers. Syria is going off the rails. And practically all of them, whenever the United States makes a strong suggestion that they do otherwise, essentially do one of these and thumb their nose ass. It didn't used to happen. In other words, the threats to America or any nation do not stop simply because we wish for them to. The threats to America do not stop simply because we are weary of war. The threats to America do not stop simply because we want them to go away. In fact, those who would do us harm seem to be empowered by such situations, just as, as the Germans were empowered after World War II when France lost their national will. Now, it's easy at this point when we talk about Syria and Russia and, and all of these things, it's easy to blame Obama for them. And clearly, he does deserve a significant amount of the blame. It's easy to criticize him for the weakness he's shown in the face of these international issues. But, at the same time, we should not be surprised by Obama's actions. Clearly, Obama's actions have been left wanting on the world stage, no doubt about that. But it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us. We should not be surprised because after all, Barack Obama ran two presidential campaigns largely based on the idea of a post-war America. 
He often talked about that in both of his campaigns. And make no mistake, a significant number of the American people, perhaps some of you out there, even voted for Barack Obama largely because of that, largely on that basis. And to my mind, that's where the significant problem is. It's not so much that a Barack Obama would be so hesitant to put America's foot down on the world stage, though that is a problem. My bigger issue is that the American people voted for a leader who would do that. The American people put him in office. A guy like that could not ever have gotten into office had we not facilitated it. That's where the significant problem is. World history proves this, if it proves anything. Peace is an aberration. It is impossible for human beings to live peacefully and without conflict in the long term. I know that it's an attractive idea that there's no war and no conflict. But show me a long-term period in world history where it's ever happened. You can't because it never has. And that's the reality of the world that America lives in. That's the reality of what we've got to deal with. No matter how sick we are of war, no matter how much we think, hey, maybe it's time to draw down the military, in spite of all of that, threats are still out there. They go on. They are still a threat to us. We are not any safer. We never will be because of human nature and yet we hear that the white house and the defense department are considering drawing back our military resources to pre-world war ii levels forgetting that we almost lost world war ii the last time because of that but yet we're being told that it's time to draw down our military it's time to live in a post-war world and yet we see terrorist attacks all over the world and yet we see Syria doing what they're doing and yet we see Putin going into the Ukraine and looking our direction is it really prudent to draw down the military is it really prudent to divert resources away from that I think not now some of you out there who are my critics are jumping up and down and, and yelling what about fiscal responsibility because most weeks I come out here and I talk a lot about fiscal responsibility I talk about reducing the amount of government reducing the role of government reducing the money spent on government I'm very consistent on that so some of you are saying well how can you talk about fiscal responsibility but at the same time back a more aggressive foreign policy I'll answer that question this way because it all comes down to priorities. The most important thing that the federal government does, the most important responsibility of the federal government is to protect us from the constant stream of potential enemies that the world offers us. That's the number one thing. If the federal government does nothing else, they must do that. Any of the other garbage a government does, is far secondary in terms of in terms of priority i don't really care if the government provides education i don't really care if the government provides oversight of this or oversight of that get rid of all those things and focus on foreign policy focus on the military and don't get me wrong i, I know i'm pissing off some people in both parties right now when i'm saying this make no mistake I know there's some of you both on the left and on the right some of you uh, younger libertarian folks the people who will be the future of the Republican Party if there is to be a future of the GOP some of you are very upset with what I'm saying because a lot of you think that if America just keeps to itself and we just tend to our own business we will never have enemies we will never be in wars we will manage to live in peace nothing could be further from the truth our actions when you actually think about it have very little to do with the creation of our adversaries or enemies in this world next to nothing to do with it instead we are a nation that has wealth land resources a prime place in the world stage that in and of itself will make people come out of the woodwork to try to oppose us, try to take us down. We could be the nicest, most virtuous nation in all the world, and it wouldn't matter because people would still want to take us out because of what we've got. So keeping to ourselves and playing nice with everybody will do nothing. It will just, it will just make us sitting ducks. 
Make no mistake, the military, our foreign affairs, and protecting us from our enemies is a far more important priority than education, charity, regulation, or most of what the federal government does. Now, I'm not saying we waste money on it. I'm saying we need to spend money intelligently. And when it comes to our foreign aid, I've said on this show before, we need to go through all of our foreign aid with a fine-tooth comb and make sure we're getting what we're paying for out of each and every bit of it. If we give foreign aid to some place, we need to make sure that they adopt American values and that they adopt Christianity. And we need to make sure that there are documentable benchmarks for what that nation is expected to do. For example, if we give foreign aid to a nation, we need to say, okay, if we give you this aid in five years, we need 40% of your population converted to Christianity. And if you don't do that, we cut off the aid. That's what we need, benchmarks for our aid. So some of you who are against foreign aid, I'm not, I'm not in that boat, but I think we can do it a lot more intelligently. But the bottom line is this, when it comes to government, when it comes to our priorities, all of the education in the world, all the social programs in the world, all the government assistance in the world, all the opportunities in the world mean absolutely nothing. They do you no good if you're dead. That's why the military and our foreign policy needs to be among the top issues for each and every one of us who vote. In closing, we cannot simply sit and wait for the world's bad guys to attack us. Because the story of France shows us that if you do that, they will not attack you until they have given themselves enough power and enough armament and enough resources to make a go of it. Instead, you must fight the fights that are going to happen anyway, but you must fight them on your terms. You must get them when they are weak, not allow them to attack you when they are strong. Sitting back enables the bad guys to ramp up their capabilities, resources, and power before they ever turn their attention to us. That's what has to be avoided. That's what France should teach us. The American people should not be used as bait to tempt the despots of the world, the Putins, the Muslims, the Kim Jong-ils, and whomever else. Now, some of you out there are saying it's past time for America to be the world's police force, that we no longer should do that. I would ask you this. If America is not the world's police force, then tell me what fills that void? What fills that void? Because make no mistake, there will be a void to be filled. If America backs down, the world will not suddenly live in peace. They never have before the creation of America. They never will at any point in the future. That is impossible for human beings to do. Human beings will always be at conflict. They will always be at war. They will always try to overtake and oppress their fellow man. That's what humans do. It's as natural to us as eating, breathing, and sleeping. So would you rather America be the world's police force with the moral high ground that we have over the rest of the world. We're not perfect, but by God, we're a lot closer to perfect than anybody else in this world is. Would you rather have that? Would you rather have the Putins of the world fill that void? Would you rather have the Muslims of the world fill that void? Would you rather have the despots and dictators of the world fill that void? Because make no mistake, somebody will fill that power vacuum. The only option I can see the only option that can be the best choice for America's future is for America to be the dominant power in the world. Anybody else puts us in danger. Any combination of people, any combination of nations or religions or whatever else that overtakes that mantle from us puts us securely in the crosshairs. We must not draw down the military. We must not stop paying attention to world affairs and Unlike the last two elections, foreign policy needs to be a very important part of our upcoming elections, of our future elections. 2008, 2012, for the first time in my life, were two elections that we really didn't talk about foreign policy a whole lot. We got a break from that. I know we're war weary, but at the risk of discouraging you, war is here. War will always be here. We will never be able to avoid war. Peace does not exist in this world in the long term. And it's damn time that we woke up and realized it and focused on protecting ourselves, protecting our interests, and exerting our will on the rest of the world before they do it to us. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.